Welcome to today's presentation. My name is Dr. Silkman and today I'm going to be talking about the following. It's all about the DNA, an analysis of the Teresa Horbach and Christine Rudy murder cases that took place in 2005. And specifically in this presentation, I will be addressing the following. Are the Teresa Horbach and Christine Rudy murder cases related? And I'll be having a look at the mitochondrial DNA analysis and a comparison between the two murder cases. And finally, I'll be looking at Stephen Avery's 1996 and 2005 genomic DNA profile results. And there's a lot of controversy about these results. And what I'll be doing is examining why there are allelic differences that were noted in 1996 compared to 2005. And clearly, this presentation demonstrates the importance of forensic molecular biology. And I found a quote by Dietrich, I think that really sums up these tragic cases, and I'll read it. We are all victims, Anselmo. Our destinies are decided by a cosmic roll of the dice the winds of the stars. How true. All right. Now, in order for us to understand the forensic science, we really need to quickly go over some basic cellular biology. Now, shown here is a typical human cell. And in the cell, it contains a structure known as a nucleus. And the nucleus contains genomic DNA and that DNA is present on structures called chromosomes and we can see here uh, a human genotype so this slide here shows a male human genotype and you can tell that because it contains an X and a Y chromosome if this human genome was from a female it will have two X chromosomes so this shows all the chromosomes which are present inside a nucleus. There is another structure known as the mitochondria and the mitochondria are also known as organelles. Mitochondria contain their own mitochondrial DNA and the important thing to note is that each mitochondria contains multiple copies of that DNA molecule and you can see that right here. So the mitochondrial DNA is circular. There are multiple copies inside the mitochondria but there is an important distinction about the mitochondria and that is the mitochondria, the mitochondrial DNA is maternally transmitted. That means all the mitochondria in your body have come from your mother. And that's extremely important, especially when we consider that both genomic DNA and mitochondrial DNA can be used for forensic DNA analysis. All right, let's have a look at the basic structure of a DNA molecule. DNA is essentially a double-stranded molecule, and it has four bases, A, G, C, and T. A specifically base pairs with T, G specifically base pairs with C, and it forms a double helical structure. Now, as scientists, when we're referring to a DNA sequence or a nucleotide sequence, we normally use numbering. We, 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 we put a, a number system on top of the DNA system, on top of the DNA strand, so that we know if we are referring to a particular nucleotide. For example here, nucleotide number six. So you may have a specific person, let's say person A, and we're looking at this particular sequence, and that person has the following sequence, ACT, GGC, 
AATG. You may have another individual that has the following sequence at exactly the same location and their sequence is ACT GGT AATG. So notice there is a one base pair difference in the DNA. These base pair differences are what makes you and I unique. We have differences in our DNA. Now of course this can be used to our advantage because we can use these changes for mitochondrial DNA forensic analysis and also for genomic DNA analysis looking at short tandem repeats. That's precisely what was done in these murder cases. But we really need to understand a little bit more about human mitochondrial DNA. So the diagram shows a mitochondrion and you can see the DNA molecule is circular and there are two particular regions highlighted in red arrows that I would like to discuss. So let's summarize the important factors about mitochondria. First of all, the human mitochondrial genome is circular and it is 16,569 base pairs long and this molecule was sequenced in 1981. Now the mitochondrial DNA sequence was redone again in 1999. This particular sequence is referred to as the revised Cambridge Reference Sequence or the RCRS. This is important especially for forensic analysis because any differences in the DNA sequences that are noted as compared to the RCRS results in a personal mitochondrial DNA profile. So in other words, your mitochondrial DNA is very likely to be different to mine. So the changes are noted down. Now, there are two very important regions in mitochondria known as HV1 and HV2. These are the so-called hypervariable regions and you can see here in the diagram denoted by those two red arrows. It is these two areas in particular which are used in forensic analysis. Now the hypervariable region number one spans the following region 16,024 to 16,365. Hypervariable region 2 spans the region 73 to 340. But what does this actually mean? Well, it's quite simple actually. What scientists discovered was for every 100 bases in the DNA, the hypervariable regions show or display one to, th to three base differences in non-related individuals. That means that if your DNA, mitochondrial DNA, and my mitochondrial DNA are sequenced, and you look particularly in the hypervariable regions number one and number two, there will be base differences. That's exactly what you require for forensic DNA analysis. You need to look for similarities as well as differences. But there is another phenomena which is present in mitochondria and that's called heteroplasmy. So essentially what happens here is that the mitochondria can have a different specific base in exactly the same position in the mitochondrial DNA so an individual will have one pool of mitochondria but some of the mitochondria will have one particular sequence and the other mitochondria will have another. Let me illustrate that. So say we were looking at a specific sequence in one of the hypervariable regions. Some of your mitochondria may have the following sequence. AAA, C, G, 
TT and the other mitochondrial DNA in the same person will have the following sequence AAA CCTT. So notice this is known as a mitochondrial DNA variant and that's called heteroplasmy. Let's have a look at our first case, the Teresa Horbach murder investigation. And here is a picture showing both uh, Teresa and her mother, Karen. Now, on November the 3rd, 2005, Karen Horbach had reported that her daughter, Teresa, was missing. We know that Teresa had taken photographs at the Avery Salvage Yard. And we all know how the case ended up. And that was both Stephen Avery and his nephew, Brendan Dassey, were sentenced to life in prison. Now here is the FBI report. And the FBI had received specific specimens for testing. They received those specimens on November the 23rd, 2005. Dr. Leslie Eisenberg had sent charred remains to the FBI, known as Q1. Also, a buckle swab was obtained from Karen Horbach, Teresa's mother, known as K1. And what the FBI did was they did a mitochondrial DNA sequence analysis on both Q1 and K1. And the question that was being asked was, are the charred remains, Q1, from Teresa? And let's not forget that Teresa's mother would have passed on her mitochondria to her daughter, Teresa. So therefore, the mitochondrial DNA sequences in Teresa should be identical to her mother, Karen. So let's have a look at the DNA, mitochondrial DNA sequencing results. And the way you interpret this is you look at the sequences that are present in hypervariable region number one and hypervariable region number two. So let's have a look at hypervariable region number one. If we look at Q1, which were the charred remains in hypervariable region number one, what was noted was that at position 16,222, this is the position in hypervariable region number one, there was a T residue or a T nucleotide. In K1, in hypervariable region number one, at position 16,222, there was also a T residue. Uh, at that position exactly the same as Q1. If we have a look at hypervariable region number two, we can see in Q1, which were the charred remains, there was a G residue at position 263, a C residue at position 309, a C residue at position 315, and also, if you read the report, at position 320, there's a C residue. So let's have a look at K1. The results are exactly the same. But note, Karen Horbach had exhibited heteroplasmy. That means that at position 320, in hypervariable region number 2, some of her mitochondria had a C at position 320 and some of her mitochondria had a T at position 320. So that's called heteroplasmy. That's normal. Nothing wrong with that. So the FBI summed up all the results and I quote, due to the closely related sequences obtained from specimens Q1 and K1, Teresa Horbach cannot be excluded as the source of the Q1 charred remains. That means that the charred remains could well have come from Teresa Horbach. She cannot be excluded in the analysis. 
but we can go a step further because more analysis was done in regards to the Teresa Hallbach murder investigation. We know that a sample of bone and tissue was examined by Sherry Colhane. This sample is known as item BZ and she was questioned about this at the Stephen Avery trial. I quote, answer, item BZ was taken into the laboratory on November the 11th, 2005. Question, and was this, when you examined this, was this a combination of bone and tissue? Answer, it appeared to be yes. So apparently on this charred bone, there was some burnt, heavily burnt muscle tissue that was still present on the bone. Therefore, Sheree Cohen was able to do a genomic DNA test on the muscle tissue. Note, the bone wasn't tested, but the muscle tissue was. And she obtained the following profile from item BZ. And I've highlighted in red, in red brackets, the alleles that actually came up. And they can be compared to Teresa Horbach herself. Now, please note that DNA was obtained, according to Ken Kratz, from an intimate sample. Well, that intimate sample, um, which was obtained by Tom Fassbender, was a pap smear that had been kept in one of the hospitals. So they uh, extracted DNA from uh, that pap smear sample and they use it as a, um, a test. So they can compare uh, the DNA profile from item BZ to the DNA from the pap smear. Now, one must understand that only a partial genomic DNA profile from the tissue taken from item BZ was obtained. But you can see straight away that item BZ has got an X chromosome, two copies of the X chromosome. That means that that tissue sample was in actual fact from a female. Now, if you have a look at the alleles that have come up, they, are exact, they match exactly the same as in Teresa Horbach's pap smear DNA sample. But remember, it is only a partial profile. Uh, the FBI now demands that you need to have a 20 loci match uh, before you can state that a particular sample belongs to a specific individual. So from looking at the mitochondrial DNA results, from looking at the partial genomic DNA profile, it is highly, highly suggested that those charred remains and item BZ are indeed from Karen, uh, from Teresa Horbach, my apologies. However, clearly uh, the DNA testing has to be redone again to ensure that a full DNA profile is obtained. Okay, now I'd like to talk about the second murder case and this also was deeply disturbing. This is the Christine Rudy murder case. Now, on November the 12th, 2005, in Clark County, Wisconsin, Christine Rudy, who was 21 at the time and six months pregnant, she was shot in the head by her husband, Sean, and then her body was dismembered. The remains of her body were thrown in the Chippewa River and many months later her torso was found with an intact baby in the womb. This is a horrendous crime. Now the head, the arms and lower legs were missing from the torso. But that's not the end of it. Adult and possible fetal burnt bone fragments that showed evidence of suspected cut marks 
were found by cadaver dogs in a very shallow burn pile at Sean's parents' home. And believe it or not, the case's forensic anthropologist was also Dr. Leslie Eisenberg. Now, we have a FBI report right here. And the FBI had received the specimens on September the 7th and the 13th in 2006. Also, a buckle swab was taken from Christine Rudy's mother. That sample K2. A bit of tissue was uh, taken from a lower leg sample, and that's known as item Q3.1. And the FBI did a mitochondrial DNA sequence analysis. And the question that was asked was, was Christine the source of the tissue? So let's have a look at the mitochondrial DNA sequencing results of K2 and Q3.1. And what do we have here? If we have a look at hypervariable region number one at K2, this is the buckle swab from Christine Rudy's mother. It is exactly the same as the reference sequence. And because the reference a mitochondrial DNA sequence has been sequenced, we can go on the internet and check the sequence at position 16,222. And there is a C residue there. So that C residue is part of the standard reference system. If we have a look at the tissue, Q3.1, it's exactly the same as the reference system, uh, reference sequence. So that also at position 16,222, there is a C residue as well. So as you can see, the hypervariable regions in K2 and Q3.1 are exactly the same. Now, if we have a look at hypervariable region number two, we can see that in K2, there's a G residue at position 263, a C residue at position 309, and a C residue at position 315. If we have a look at the tissue sample Q3.1, it is exactly the same. So note, we don't see any heteroplasmy in either K2 or Q3.1. So the FBI wrote the following conclusion, and I quote, the mitochondrial DNA sequences from item Q3.1 and K2 are the same. Therefore, Christine M. Rudy cannot be excluded as the source of the Q3.1 tissue. So therefore, the mitochondrial DNA sequences are exactly the same in K2 and Q3.1. Now, I'd just like to point out that a full genomic DNA profile was done as well. Unfortunately, the FBI uh, did not publish the results. The results were not published, but they also took a DNA swab from the mother and the father of uh, Christine Rudy, and they were able to determine that Christine Rudy was indeed the offspring from her parents. So in other words, it was a complete match. So this is an excellent example of the use of both mitochondrial DNA and genomic DNA for forensic DNA analysis in identifying a murder victim. Okay, there's been a lot of controversy about the mitochondrial DNA results between the Teresa Hallbach murder case and also in the Christine uh, Rudy murder case. So what I'm going to do is actually compare uh, both mitochondrial DNA results and let's see if there are differences or similarities. Let's have a look at the Teresa Horbach murder case. So here we're looking at Q1 and K1. 
both have a T residue at position 16,222. If we have a look at the Christine Rudy case, we can see that in K2 and Q3.1, at position 16,222, there is a C residue in both of them. Straight away, that tells you the mitochondria of all those samples are different. That's a huge change from one base to another. They cannot be the same mitochondria. If we have a look at hypervariable region number two, we note here that um, Karen Horbach has got heteroplasmy and the Q1 cremains at position 320 have got a C residue just like Karen Horbach does. Now, if we have a look at the hypervariable regions uh, in K2 and Q3.1, we can see that they are both exactly the same. But there is no heteroplasmy in either K2 or Q3.1. That tells you straight away that the mitochondria are different. So the conclusion is that the mitochondrial DNA sequences of items Q1 and K1 are different from items K2 and Q3.1. Now I know what some of you are thinking, but wait Dr. Silkman, I do see some similarities and you're right. Look at them. They're all identical. But do not panic. That's what is known as a common haplotype. So if you sequence the mitochondria of a lot of individuals who tend to be in the same population, same population group, you'll find that there are common haplotypes in various um, uh, human population groups around the world. And that those um, common haplotypes they can be different, like for example if you're in Asia or in Africa, uh, in Australia, so they do vary. But there's clearly enough critical differences that we can conclude that the mitochondria in the Teresa Horbach murder case are completely different to the mitochondria in the Christine Rudy uh, murder case. Okay, so what I'd like to do is to finish my presentation and have a look at the Stephen Avery's genomic DNA profile results and have a look at the results obtained in 1996 and compare them to the results obtained in 2005. Now this has been very controversial and there's been a lot of really good discussion on the internet. So let's see if we can make sense of these results. So what we have here on the left hand side are the 2005 PCR genomic DNA results. Now I'd like to state that all of those results were performed by Cherie Cohane. She had utilized the same primers, the same PCR amplification kit and also a computer was used to read the results, so no human intervention was required. It was all done by computer. And on the right hand side, we can see the relationship. Clearly, uh, we have Dolores as being Stephen's mum, Alan being Stephen's father, and Stephen being the sibling or the offspring. So this way, we can directly check every allele that's present in Stephen Avery. So let's start off with the simplest one, TPOX, uh, the locus TPOX. You can see that Dolores is homozygous 9. That means she contains two copies of the 9 allele. The father, Alan, is heterozygous. He's got a copy of the 8 and the 11 allele and Stephen inherited a 9 from his mother and an 11 from his father. So in 2005 for TPOX he was 9 and 11 
And that's exactly the result that was obtained in 1996, 9 and 11. So clearly that one worked very well. Let's have a look at the next one, THO1. Now, Dolores is homozygous 9.3. The father, Alan, is homozygous 9.3. And that's exactly what we expect for Stephen to have. He also is homozygous 9.3. But wait, in 1996, a 10 allele came up. So clearly there is a difference between the 1996 result and the 2005 result. Now let's have a look at the final allele that was tested in 1996. You've got to remember that only three alleles were tested in 1996, whereas in 2005 a full profile was done. Now this is the CSF1PO uh, locus. Dolores, the mother, is heterozygous and she contains an 11 and 12 allele. The father, Alan, contain, he is homozygous 12. And Stephen inherited a 12 allele from his mother and a 12 allele from his father. He clearly is a 12 homozygous 12, there is no 7 allele anywhere. However, in 1996, they got a 7 allele result. Clearly, that is a big difference from the result obtained in 2005. So we have one allele result for TPOX agreeing, but the other two are different. So the question we want to ask is, why are there differences in the genomic DNA profile results for THO1 and CSF1PO loci in 1996 and 2005? Now, if you know anything about DNA and genetics, your alleles are not going to change at all. You've got them from birth. Those allelic results should be identical. So what is actually going on with these results? Why are they different? Well, in order to answer, we need to deep dive into the DNA analysis. All right, let's have a look at the THO1 locus. Now you can go to a governmental website and it publishes all the uh, loci, the PCR primers that we used, and the allele sizes. So we can see what type of results uh, one would expect. The first thing that strikes you is that there are many different types of primers that have been used throughout the years. And we know that uh, Cherie Cohen used primer set number six in order to amplify the THO1 locus. If you have a look at her DNA report, um, you can see that she used the Powerplex Cysteine Amplification Kit in 2005. Unfortunately, we don't know what primer set was used in 1996, but it couldn't have been set 6. It had to be one of the earlier ones that were done in 1996. You've got to remember that uh, the forensic testing in 1996 was still in its early embryonic stage. Uh, great advances have been made since. Okay, so we know that Cherie Cohen used set 6 for the PCR primers. Now, let's have a look at the alleles that have come up for the THO1 locus. Now, we know that in 1996 allele number 10 came up and in 2005 9.3 came up. Now we know that Stephen Avery has to be 9.3. Now what is curious here are the allele size differences between 9.3 and 10. 
And no matter what primer set you use, there is only a one nucleotide difference. Bang, that explains it straight away. The difference between the 9.3 and the 10 allele for the TH01 locus is one nucleotide. That's the smallest difference you can have in a DNA molecule, one nucleotide. So clearly, it is a resolution error that happened in 1996. So to try and distinguish a sequence that is only different by one nucleotide, by eye, if you're looking at a gel, is almost impossible to do. It'll be very, very difficult to do. And that explains why there is a difference between those two results. One nucleotide, it's almost impossible to tell the difference. Okay, now let's have a look at this one, the CSF 1PO locus. Now again, if we have a look at the primers, we can see that throughout the years there have been at least five different sets of primers that have been used to amplify up that locus. Now we know that Sharie Cohane used the Powerplex 16, uh, 16 system in 2005. So she's used set four primers to amplify up the CSF 1PO locus. Now let's have a look at the alleles. We know that in 1996, allele number seven came up. In 2005, allele 12 came up. We know that Stephen Avery must be allele 12 because we have the full genetic profile of his mother and his father. So if we have a look at the allele difference between seven and 12, we note Again, that is a relatively small number, 20 nucleotides, but that is quite significant. You should be able to tell a 20 nucleotide difference. But what you note is the repeat that's amplified up consists of a very small sequence, AGAT. And the difference between the 12 allele and the 7 allele are five copies of the sequence AGAT. Perfectly. So it's likely that the difference between the 7 allele and the, twin al and the 12 allele for the CSF 1PO locus is 20 nucleotides. That's clearly an experimental error that took place in 1996. We know that Stephen is definitely 12 and not seven. So something had gone wrong when the experiment was done in 1996. Because don't forget, for one of the low side that was tested, the result was perfect. So the primer combination that they had used for that particular locus was fine. But however, something went drastically wrong for CSF 1PO back in 1996. Okay, so let's summarize the results. Now, the allele results for THO1, CSF 1PO, and TPOX for Stephen Avery should be exactly the same. It doesn't matter whether you tested in 1996 and 2005, the allele results should be the same. No question. However, we know that the PCR primers and the amplification kits that we used in 1996 compared to 2005 were very, very likely different. Now we know that if you work in this particular field of amplifying up sequences, certain sequences and certain primers can definitely give you PCR issues. Now 20 nucleotide difference should have been picked up. You can forgive a one nucleotide difference. That's very easy to get wrong, but 20 should have been picked up. 
So something went wrong in 1996. Now, as I've stated, PCR technology has rapidly advanced since 1996. There's been a lot of refinements, but critically, automation uh, is now the go. Everything is done by a machine, and furthermore, uh, computers are used to read the results. So as I state here, computers are now used to record DNA profile results, especially in 2005, which means you've got much greater accuracy. You've got a computer scanning the results and can give back extremely accurate results. You're not reliant on a visual interpretation because that's how things were done many years ago. You had to look at a gel uh, to make a call or determination on a particular allele size. Trust me, it's very easy to make a mistake. And like I said to you before, a one nucleotide difference, you're definitely going to make errors. Okay, so to summarize, both simple resolution and experimental errors, they do explain the differences between the 1996 and 2005 DNA profile results. We've looked at the alleles. We've seen the differences. One, we can easily explain. The other likely was due to uh, experimental error. Now, of course, now I'm not sure because I haven't read the original documents. All of that could have been resolved if they also tested Stephen's mother and father back in 1996 to see if those allele results were consistent or different. That would have told the experimenters straight away that something had gone wrong. Okay, now despite all of that, did it actually make a difference in 1996? So even if all the allele results were perfect, as in they were the same as in 2005, would it have made a difference to Stephen? Regrettably, no. Why? Because the judge was not convinced that Stephen Avery could be excluded. That was the issue all along. The judge wasn't willing to make that call, uh, despite the fact that there was another allele that couldn't be accounted for. The judge was not convinced, unfortunately, in 1996, which meant that Stephen had remained in prison. Now, here's the kicker. Stephen Avery was eventually exonerated in 2003 when Cherie Colhane, who was the DNA analysis, obtained a full genomic DNA profile from a single pubic hair and it proved that it was not Stephen's but an actual fact from Gregory Allen. Of course, we've discussed the controversies uh, already Cherie Cohen had actually um, stood on that sample for a year before it was tested. And to obtain a genetic profile, we're talking about a couple of hours, maybe a day, to get a result. So to sit on that result, to sit on the sample, sorry, for a year um, is actually quite disgraceful. Okay. So that is the end of my presentation. I hope you have seen the uh, power of using uh, mitochondrial DNA and genomic DNA testing. And the good thing is, is that when things don't quite add up, we can go back and look at the original material to see if we can actually sort out what has gone wrong. Because remember, um, Whenever humans are involved in doing any form of testing, as you're probably all aware, mistakes can take place. Of course, we now have uh, the new Andy Rapid DNA testing system, and I would imagine that a machine like that would be extremely accurate. Unfortunately, 
That type of technology did not exist in 1996 nor 2005, but we have that now. Thank you very much, uh, guys. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Um, I've used a variety of references here. And of course, if you want to have a look uh, at the mitochondrial DNA sequence or the STR databases or the original uh, documents, um, please feel free. I just want to note, um, I didn't mention it before, but how life is so bizarre when you see this picture of Stephen looking at Penny and uh, it's just so frightening to believe that uh, this gentleman is now in prison again and hopefully DNA will set both him and his nephew free.